New Testament reading this morning comes from the book of the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 5. The Spirit has been poured out. The apostles are working and preaching. And the church is coming together, selling things, and bringing it and laying it at the apostles' feet. That's where we are in Acts chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and, and wrapped him and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all these, the church, and upon all who heard these things. Amen. Thus far in the reading of God's Word. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we ask now that you would give us clarity, a right understanding of who you are, of who Jesus Christ is, and what you have done. That we may see ourselves as sinners saved only by grace, who have received forgiveness only by the precious blood of Christ. Guide our minds, our hearts, by your Spirit this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Where would you go in Scripture to find the preciousness of Jesus? Maybe feeding the 5,000. Maybe his birth. Maybe you would go to the cross. How about to the country of the Gadarenes? That's where Jesus met two demon-possessed men who came out of the tombs who were so fierce that they had to be bound with chains. That's where Jesus engaged with the demons within these men. That's where Jesus cast the demons out and sent them into the herd of pigs, wiping out that herd. And that's where the people of the city came out and begged him to leave. the preciousness of Jesus' blood. 
Sometimes the negative really shows us the positive, doesn't it? Those at the country of Gadarenes did not understand Jesus. They did not understand his work. They didn't believe that Jesus was actually good for them. And thus they begged him to leave. They didn't want to be near him. They didn't want to be near his works. They loved their pigs. They loved the world. If we don't know who Jesus is, and what he came to do, then we'll never grasp the preciousness of his blood. We'll opt for the pigs every time. In this passage that we have before us today, there's much, much here as Joseph's brothers now finally engage with him after 13 plus years. They're not understanding themselves as sinners before a holy God. They're not seeing their end in their sin as being those who will receive the wrath of God. And they're certainly not seeing the blessing of forgiveness. Joseph has been sold off. He's gone down to Egypt. <clears throat> given a ticket by his brothers, so to speak. He's been suffering much toil and tribulation. And while he's been in prison, his family has been caught in sin. <clears throat> but yet Joseph was all along being brought closer and closer to God. Through his trials, through his tribulations, he was being taught to wait upon the Lord. He was being taught humility and righteousness and finally the time came when he would be brought out of the dungeon and set upon his elevated throne by Pharaoh as he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Seven years of abundance, seven years of famine. And now we enter into that account as Joseph's brothers come seeking that blessing to save them from starvation. I'd like us to see this morning that as one confesses to be a shameful sinner before God and trusts only in Jesus, the free gift of forgiveness can be and is received with fear and joy. Three points. First, perceiving themselves, spies or honest men. Secondly, perceiving their end, guilty or merely caught, and then finally, perceiving for forgiveness, pay or paid for. Let's begin with our first point, perceiving themselves. <clears throat> While Joseph's position has been established, we see that right away in verse 6. We would know that even if we had read what had come before it. But verse 6, Moses tells us now, Joseph was governor. Others have it as Joseph was ruler. Certainly, they're telling us the... Spirit is telling us that Joseph has now been elevated to that position. That second dream of Joseph has come to pass. The sun, the moon, the stars, so to speak, the 11 stars, have bowed down to him. The Egypt being the center of the world, so to speak, at this time. The center of power. It was as if, as the Egyptians looked to Joseph for their food, now they're coming to him to direct them as to what they should do. It's as if the sun, moon, and stars were bowing down before him. And now the first dream, the first dream was about to be fulfilled as well. Remember Joseph's first dream. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. Indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. Verse 6, Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Done. Complete. You might say we can stop here. The two dreams of Joseph have been fulfilled. Everything is right in the world. Joseph has a family. He's been exalted. 
after suffering, humiliation, and trouble, and all his dreams have come to pass. Shouldn't that be the end? The brothers are now bowing down before him. Well, not yet. This is not where the history of redemption finds its end. There's much more to come. The event here, even here, was not complete. So why does Joseph speak roughly? Why doesn't he reveal himself? Why doesn't he warmly welcome his brothers? What's going on? Is he seeking revenge? He's been suffering for 13 plus years. Was he seeking to punish his brothers in return for that which they had done to him? Was Joseph actually remembering his toil and now wanted that revenge? No, not likely. Remember, Joseph had been made by God to forget. Verse 51 of chapter 41. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Any revenge sought by Joseph would seemingly be in conflict with that truth. You see that Joseph remembers his dreams. Verse 9, Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them. It seems to be the key that helps us. That helps us understand the, the next few verses, the, the next chapters and the interaction between Joseph and his brothers. Remember, Joseph's dream, his first dream, pictured himself as a sheaf which arose and stood upright. Joseph is pictured as being upright before his brothers. Now, we might think that was a picture of rule, and certainly it seems to have been. His brothers are now bowing down before him. He is in that position of rule. He is that chariot. He's gone throughout Egypt. He's a ruler. He's a governor. But it appears that this was also a picture of uprightness or of righteousness before his brothers. Maybe Joseph remembers that he was to be righteous before these, before even these who had wronged him 13 years ago. Maybe Joseph was to treat them in such a way that they might also become upright before the Lord. Isn't that what Jesus does? Isn't that what what Paul writes about Jesus doing? Ephesians 5. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, that she should be holy and without blemish. That's what Jesus does. Maybe that's what Joseph is seeking to do with his brothers. Well, who were these brothers? Clearly, Joseph knew them. He recognized them. The text is clear. There's some irony here that, that he recognizes them and yet uses their unrecognition of him to accomplish his means, his, his work. Again, isn't that what Jesus did? The glory of the Son of God was veiled by His human nature, and so Jesus, Jesus was able to and did approach many to probe and test their hearts. He couldn't have done that if His true identity was revealed. He looked nothing like a king. He came humbly. And so Joseph recognizes his brothers, and he calls them spies. He said to them, you are spies. What is a spy? If you look that up in the dictionary in Webster's, it's one who goes to watch others, one who goes to see the weakness in others. And we think of it in terms of war. We think of it in terms of finding the, the place where the land is undefended. But we can think of it in terms of one who goes just to observe others. To see, where are your weaknesses? Where's your downfall? Where, what's your behavior like? How am I better than you? 
A spy is one who enters deceitfully by concealing his true identity and considers only the behavior of others, looking for and declaring their weaknesses. One who seeks to create division and loss, not oneness and gain. Joseph sums it up in a sense when he accuses the brothers of coming to see the nakedness of the land. The undefended portions. Isn't that exactly what they did to Joseph? As Joseph is coming to them, as, as his father directed them to go and see how, how your brothers are doing, how are the flocks, isn't that what they did to Joseph? Looking at that undefended portion, what they could remove from him, how they could observe him and, and create division and loss. In reality, these brothers have arrived before Joseph in their shame and in their nakedness before him as sinners, before a righteous and upright man. The statement or claim of Joseph against his brothers appears to be full of irony. To call our attention to, to the estate of the brothers as they bow before the one whom they have offended. Yes, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. He saw them as they were, unrepentant sinners, living and dwelling in their sin. And what did the brothers say in response? We're honest men. We're honest men. At least five times in this passage, that word appears. Honest men. That's how the brothers perceived themselves. Fair in dealing with others. Free from fraud. Acting and having the disposition to act at all times according to justice or correct moral principles. That's Webster's. That's what they were saying. We're truth tellers. There's no deceit within us. And if they were, they were truth tellers, they would live. But if they were liars, if they were unjust, if they were tricksters, if they were deceitful men, they would die. Like Ananias and Sapphira, who didn't understand that the Holy Spirit was able to perceive which was going on in their hearts. How do you perceive yourself today? Joseph's brothers understood themselves as honest men, men of integrity. But Joseph begins the work of showing his brothers that they were not men of integrity, hereby pricking their hearts, by, by calling them out as spies. The brothers stood naked before Joseph. <clears throat> he recognized them. He knew them not only as his brothers, but as sinners who had sinned against God and against him. And like Jesus knew that the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders of the day, hated him, Joseph knew that his brothers were those who hated him deeply. They hated him enough to send him off, away from them, forever to be forgotten. And so they stand before Joseph with their hearts open, bare and uncovered, as dishonest, as hateful men. And yet they perceive themselves as honest men. How do you stand before God today? Do you understand yourselves as, as the brothers of Joseph saw themselves? Honest men, women, children, upright, fair, acting and having the disposition at all times to act according to justice or correct moral principles. If so, listen to the psalmist. They've all turned aside. They've together become corrupt. There's no one who does good, no, not one. Brothers and sisters, the call today is to confess. 
we are not honest. We are sinners standing before a holy God. We're not fair and upright. And only when we do that, only when we see ourselves that way, can then we receive the precious blood of Christ that covers us completely in His honesty, in His righteousness. Brings us to our second point, perceiving their end. The brothers had now entered into Joseph's realm. Thirteen years ago, Joseph entered into their realm and was thrown into a pit. Now the brothers have walked into Egypt and subjected themselves to the governance, the rule of Joseph. The brothers would now and were now subject to the laws, the rules, the standards of Joseph. Previously, they had cast off the word of God by sending Joseph away. They had been living outside of the law now for many years and were now coming back under the righteous law, the upright rule now of Joseph. And now he tests them, he probes them, he pricks the hearts of his brothers to see if there was any life left in them. In this manner, verse 15, you shall be tested by the life of Pharaoh and oath you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. And he puts them all together in prison for three days. Think of that. When Joseph was in prison, he had things to do. He had work to do. Now, as the brothers, the ten of them, are put in prison, likely they're not put to work. All they have is each other. And they've got three days now to think why. Why are we here? Nothing else to do but to dwell upon their situation and why they'd been cast into prison. They all knew that they were going to be kept in that place for a long time. Somebody's got to go get Benjamin and bring him back. And we're here until that happens. Waiting, thinking, talking. finally released by Joseph, but with a threat of death. Joseph comes to them and says, do this and live, for I fear God. Go, carry grain for the famine of your houses, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified. It was as if Joseph said, prove your honesty. Prove that truth resides within your lips and within your heart. Do this and live. As their superior, now he issues this one single command for these two to do and live. Body and soul are in view here. Joseph cared for their physical well-being by giving them grain, but he was testing their hearts. By his words, by his command to return, Joseph was causing these to examine themselves. There's a lack, a void of truth amongst this family. It began with Jacob as he deceives his father Isaac and receives his blessing, the blessing that was for his brother. We see it in the brothers as they returned to Jacob and showed him the blood-stained tunic. We saw it in Judah and Tamar. Now this lack of truth or honesty was being brought to a point of resolution. Would these live or die? Joseph has placed a condition of truth around their return and receipt of life-sustaining food during this famine. Jesus does the same, doesn't he? Who may ascend the holy hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. It's impossible to ascend the holy hill of the Lord in dishonesty, in untruth, in lies. It's only, only by Jesus, the one who truly has clean hands, that we may, with him, ascend that holy hill. Well, now upon their release, upon hearing these words of Joseph, upon reflecting for three days in prison, uh, these men come to this thought, You've been caught. 
have been caught in dishonesty. We are truly guilty concerning our brother. Their minds go back 13 plus years now to what they did to Joseph. They are remembering, they are reminded, it's been brought to their hearts now, so much so to the extent that Reuben can say, his blood is now required of us. Were they truly sorrowful? Or were they merely caught? It seems to be the latter. Reuben is very concerned that he might need to die now in the place of his brother. Physical death is the concern. It doesn't look like there's sorrow over sin committed against a holy God. It looks like they're grieving over the possibility of reaching the end, their bodily deaths. They were distressed over the possibility of receiving physical punishment, not distressed over their eternal well-being. Not distressed over their sins against a holy God. They were not grasping the true end of their sin, which was eternal death. For the wages of sin is death. They weren't seeing that. They weren't grasping. They were not understanding that. It seems they were sorrowful for being caught. There's a difference between sorrow over sin, which may be termed guilt and sorrow over being caught and thus anticipating the just judgment to be received. Judas, Judas knew of guilt. He knew that he had broken the law against Jesus Christ himself and that he was liable to punishment. And as a result, he hangs himself. But was Judas sorrowful because he had offended and sinned against the holy God of creation? Was Judas sorrowful because he had grieved the Spirit? Was Judas sorrowful because he had sinned against the Son of God, the Savior of the world, by denying Him before the world? We don't have any indication of that in Scripture. We see that kind of sorrow in Peter, don't we? As Peter denies Christ three times and the Lord looks and, and turns and sees Peter and Peter remembers what the Lord had said before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times, he goes out and he weeps bitterly. That's sorrow for offending a holy God. When do you recognize your sin? When do you recognize your transgressions, your wrongdoings? Joseph's brothers spent 13 years not recognizing their transgression against God and against Joseph. There was no indication in this account of Joseph that they had recognized what they had done and gone to the Lord and confessed their sins. In fact, just the opposite. Up to this point, there's been no recognition that they offended God. It's only as they are freed from three days in lockup in prison that these confessions flow from their lips. When do you recognize your sin? And when you do, do you do it with the understanding of the true end of your sin? Brothers and sisters, if you do that, that changes everything. When you recognize and confess that you've indeed sinned against and offended not merely your husband or your wife or your father or your mother or your friend, but God. God has been offended. Then you immediately remember that the wages of sin is death, eternal fire and hell, where the worm does not, does not die nor the flame extinguish when you see the end of your sin, that changes your confession. It changes the sincerity of your confession. It changes the sorrow of your heart as you understand that the offense has been committed against God and is so offensive that the only just and right punishment is eternal death. At the extent of the punishment, the gravity of the punishment must cause you to consider the gravity or the weight of the offense that you've committed against God. And how you've grieved the Spirit. If 
your sin is so bad that you've earned eternal life in the flames of hell. The brothers of Joseph didn't seem to perceive the end of their sin. And therefore their guilt appeared shallow and insincere. But if you grasp the magnitude of your offense against God, against Jesus Christ, your sorrow, your guilt, should never be characterized as insincere or shallow. Brings us to our third point, perceiving forgiveness. Well, as the brothers find that they have the grain as they're headed home now, and they have the money in their sack. One of them finds it and exclaims to the others, my money's been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that God has done to us? Apparently only one found the money as they're on the road, but then when they get home and they're all emptying their sacks, they all find that all of their money has been returned. And what's their reaction? Verse 35, they were afraid. Kind of an unexpected reaction to the presence of the purchase money in their bags. We might consider they wondered. We might consider that they were amazed. We might even think, well, they're thankful. We've got grain. We've got provisions. We've got our freedom, and we've got our money. It seems to be similar to the Gadarenes. As goodness is being poured out upon these, the goodness of Joseph, their response is fear. The Gadarenes were seized with great fear, and not in a good way. And the brothers, as, as they're receiving these good things, are, are gripped with, with fear. They were not seeing what was happening to them as a blessing. Joseph gave the command to fill their sacks with grain and to restore every man's money to his sack, and he gave them provisions for their journey, and he did that for them. It seems that Joseph was pouring out goodness and mercy. Repay no one evil for evil. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think Joseph was living by that principle. He was the upright one. In the midst of his brothers who were bowed down, he was pouring out blessing upon them, and they refused to trust him. Even Jacob, think of all the blessings. First, that they were even permitted to speak to the Lord of the, of the country. Quite a blessing. And that while the Lord, Joseph, considered them to be spies, nonetheless he blessed them with freedom, allowing them to return to their home and to take with them provisions, not only for their journey, but for their families, grain for which they had come. And Joseph is even told of the promise. Joseph, uh, Jacob is told of Joseph's promise. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Come back. Bring your brother. Prove your truth. Yet Jacob perceives all of this as evil and would not trust. Jacob, like his sons, as they see the money returned in their sacks, perceive all these events as not good, not a blessing, but even a curse, as being opposed to his happiness. Think of Jacob's words as the brothers come back. You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Ja Jacob refuses to trust the words of the Lord of the land was his beloved son. Where was Jacob's concern for his entire family? They were on the brink of starvation, of extermination. Why wasn't he considering their long-term well-being? Why was he only thinking about himself and his grief? How was Jacob perceiving God? 
as one who is good or as one who is continually pouring out opposition to him and to his children? Are you seeing the root of the problem in the generations of Jacob? They all lack trust in God. None but Joseph appeared to trust that, that the Lord their God was working toward their good. Remember the exclamation of the brothers as they see the money restored. What is this that God has done to us? Their perception is that God was against them. And so they fear when they don't understand what God was doing or who God was and is. So Jacob refuses to accept the kindness being offered by the Lord of the land as he perceives that the God of heaven and earth was against him. There's a complete lack of joy. There was no rejoicing because they had received grain. There was no rejoicing that the brothers had been released. There was only fear. Fear of more loss. They had no recognition of what God was doing in their lives. Well, brothers and sisters, here's the picture. These brothers could not pay for the food, for the grain. Not this time, not the next time. It had already been paid for. For these brothers, it was not for sale. It was a blessing, a free gift from the one they perceived to be against them. Does it remind you of anything? Hoping that it reminds you of the blood of Christ. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, verse 6. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Romans 5, verse 10. See, that's forgiveness. And it's not for anything within us or done by us. It's only for the perfect obedience and full satisfaction of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jacob and his sons didn't perceive this. They didn't perceive God rightly. They didn't see what he was doing. The brothers of Joseph were unable to, to point and wrap their minds around this idea of the grain as a free gift that would work to save their physical bodies. And then it was given, and it was telling them that they needed to accept the free gift of forgiveness from God. That the brothers of Joseph, as well as the father of Joseph, Jacob, needed to come to trust God that they might be saved they would stop perceiving God as the one who was pouring out evil upon them and see Him as the one who was leading them to His righteousness. How do you understand God today? Is God that taskmaster who makes you earn forgiveness? Constantly calling you to work hard to gain his favor such that he might grant it to you? If you do, then it's likely that you're seeking to work off your sins today. Maybe you're feeling guilty and laboring to rid yourself of it. Maybe you're seeking to earn the forgiveness that you desperately need. Brothers and sisters, if that describes you this morning, you can't. It's not possible. For many reasons, for many biblical reasons, you can't work off your sin. You can't earn forgiveness. I want you to focus on just one thing this morning. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is too precious. It's like the little grain that was available in Egypt, where 
all the starving world was coming. Coming to this one place to get that, that bit of grain that was left in the world so precious that the brothers couldn't even pay for it. That's the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which does work forgiveness. Which in a sense is forgiveness and it is precious. It cannot be purchased. The cost is too great. It can't be purchased because it's given freely. This is grace. It's only by grace that you can be forgiven. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. My brothers and sisters, that we would praise God. He loves us so much that he would give us as a free gift the precious blood of Christ to wash away our sins. Yes, as one confesses to be a sinful, a shameful sinner before God and trusts only in Jesus, the free gift of forgiveness is received with fear and joy. The Gadarenes did not trust that Jesus was good for them. They longed after their pigs in this world. They was afraid that Jesus was taking that away from them. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ has poured out blessing upon blessing upon us. Foremost is his blood. What a precious gift we have in our Savior. Let's rejoice in Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, help us, Lord God. We are sinners who are prone to forgetting who you are. We are prone to forgetting that you are the God who gives us good things and especially the preciousness of the blood of Christ. We are those who, who think upon ourselves as good people. And Father, we, we pray that you'd help us and remind us that there is no one good, that there's only one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that you lead us and guide us into praising you for the forgiveness, the free forgiveness we have in the blood of Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.